Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! This happened many years ago during a very busy holiday season. My brother was handicapped and confined to a wheelchair because of a car accident. Mom has a large handicapped van that unloads on the passenger side. So we always try to park in the first spot so we can unload him, kind of in traffic as places didn't always make the handicapped spot large enough. Anyways, we decided to head to the local mall to shop for the day and have circled the mall for about 45 minutes looking for a spot to park. We finally find one that fits exactly what we need and start heading that way. As we are almost there, a guy parks in the spot and starts heading into the mall just as we get there. I rolled my window down and also noticed he wasn't handicapped or had any stickers or plug cards. I asked him if he would move since he didn't need that spot that was told to get lost. That he was only going to be there for a few minutes. Then he took off into the mall. I decided to park right behind him and since he pulled right up to the handicap post, there was no way he was getting out. We unload my brother and start heading into the mall when a guy starts coming out. Sees our van parked behind him, noticing he can't get out. He starts demanding that I move the van and I return the get lost comment he gave me earlier. Then he tells me he will call the police if I don't move. I tell him to go ahead. While he's on the phone with the police, small security stops by to help out. I tell them my side of the encounter and they then give the other guy's story. During this time, local police show up. Mall security then asks, if I would be nice and allow the guy to pull out and I could have his spot. I kinda let them know that if he had been a bit nicer at the beginning, I might have considered it, but since he was a total jerk, I wasn't going to. Local police were very busy writing up the ticket for parking illegally in a handicapped space. Mall security and local police chatted for a few minutes and both came over to me to see if I would move the van again. I let them know that I would not because the guy was such a jerk to us. To my surprise, both small security and local police just smiled and told us to have a good day shopping. We were inside the mall for a good six hours and when we came back out, the guy was nowhere to be found. His car was still there with another ticket on his window. Okay, I know this is long, but I hope it's a fun read. I do have to be careful because two of these people have rather high profiles on the internet, but one is really well known. I didn't include as many details as I would have liked because they could be easily identified. So on with what I hope are the juicy details. Over 10 years ago, I worked for a company owned by a married couple whom we were referred to as the McGrifties. The wife told her first lie to me during the job interview, not the last though. She mentioned an employee who would be going on maternity leave and said that we knew she was pregnant when we hired her. I later learned from the pregnant employee herself, just in passing, that she didn't know she was pregnant when she started working there. Just a stupid lie so they could look like nicer people than they were. The employee turnover was insane. They were micromanagers who treated their employees horribly. One guy submitted his two-week notice the week before we had a two-day holiday and they made it effective immediately, thus screwing him out of pay for those days. Go into the bathroom? Well, be sure to lock that in time since they need to know you spent every minute. Their employee reviews mention words like toxic, terrible, and wish I could forget I worked there. We once had some overflow work and they had me find someone to handle it. Literally, the first person I called turned me down flat. She had already done work for them and had to take them to court to get paid and still didn't recover all what she was owed. I had complained to a few co-workers regarding an ongoing issue with our 401k contributions to our accounts along with a few other issues. It got back to management and I was fired. I was a really good employee but was tired of being treated not just poorly but with great suspicion. They assumed everyone was out to screw them which will tell you something about their own approach to other people. At that point, I didn't care. But when they got my unemployment denied because someone sent me an email, that really pissed me off. 
Yeah, that was a crabby decision by the commission, but they bought that crab anyway. The woman at the commission actually asked me in the snottiest voice just how did that person, a former employee, know my email? Yeah, lady, he used to work there. He knew everyone. Here's some pity revenge to tide you over. Not terribly long after that, one of my former co-workers sent me a copy of the wife's mugshot. Apparently, she had been pulled over for a traffic violation. Things went sideways and she was arrested. I wasn't a bit surprised because she was always an entitled witch who thought rules didn't apply to her. Over the next few days, I went to several different places with fax services and sent her mugshot to the company's fax number. I also went by at night to tape some up around their office building. So here we are many years later, and about a year ago, I was reading some gossip columns about celebrities and saw a familiar name. One of the McGrifty's offspring has become engaged to a celebrity worth double-digit millions. Of course, my curiosity was sparked, so I thought I would see if they were even in business any longer. I turned to my friend Google and found they are, the final logic and justice, indeed still in business. However, I also discovered the delightful news that the husband was in the middle of an active bankruptcy. I could only see docket entries, which include the motion for emergency sale of their homestead. Wondering if they had managed to sell their million dollar plus home, I popped over the county assessor's website and looked up their address. They still showed as owners, but when I checked ownership history, I saw that the title had been transferred a few months before. Okay, so they did sell the house to an LLC. Hmm, interesting. I am on alert. I decided to look a little closer at MB and find their Instagram account. Well, well, what do you know? The Instagram name is almost the same name that took title to the McGrifty's house. Now, I am very interested and I really need to know what the house sold for. I'm suspicious by nature and I know these people. Besides smelling a rat, I also smell an opportunity to drop some karma on them. I did a little more digging and finally hit gold with a 72-page document that includes every lien and judgment against them. And there are lots. They have judgments against them for two different banks. One for around two million and another over half a million. Their house went into foreclosure some months back and they owed 400k more than the property was worth. I also found a notice from the state commission that they owe an employee 3k. The sweetest, though, is that they have close to $2 million in IRS tax liens against them. All told, they were close to $4 million in debt. I was overjoyed. The best part, however, was a much desired and lovely copy of the sales contract, which shows the sales price is more than five hundred k below the appraised value. The motion also states that the husband says that this is a good sales price. Yeah, for the buyer. His future XXX in law. He doesn't care since he isn't getting a nickel of the money. It's all going to the mortgage company who agreed to settle for the sales price. Now, I am no bankruptcy attorney, but this looks shady as heck to me, and as a taxpaying US citizen, I feel compelled to report what I believe might be fraud. I copied the tax rolls showing properties in that area rarely sell for under a million, and their property was valued at over 1.3 million. I also included a screenshot of MB's Instagram page announcing the engagement and showing the Instagram name was pretty much the same as a purchaser. One last thing I found was a little blurb along with her picture in the rich neighborhood happenings publication mentioning the McGrifties hosted an intimate get-together for 30 at some nightclub around the holidays. After the husband filed for bankruptcy and all while asking the court to discharge millions upon millions in debt. Just for fun, I took a screenshot of that too. I sent copies of all of them to the bankruptcy judge, bankruptcy trustee, and lawyers for the mortgage company along with a nice cover letter pointing out a few other inconsistencies. Then, I sit back and I wait. After a bit of thought, I decide the information I have is too special not to be shared with others. Now, the wife considers herself a mover and a shaker, in the higher echelons of the business world, when in truth she's just a pretentious wannabe. And the broke one at that. I must give her credit though, she has a large internet presence and has promoted herself quite effectively. 
A lot of that is based on something she did a while back that brought her a lot of attention at the time, and she played it up to the hilt. Funny thing though, I believe that very same accomplishment is what started the downward financial spiral since it was a very expensive endeavor that doesn't seem to have paid off as they had hoped. Several websites list the company's revenue at 5 to 10 millions a year, but it's a lie. Less than two years ago, the company had a total of $391.37 in the only corporate bank account. Gotta love those bankruptcy records. That kind of blatant nonsense really cheeses me off, so I sent copies of all the judgments and highlighted the part where the missus said they were broke and drowning in debt to the chair of some Ivy League college women's board that she belongs to and pays 20k a year to be a member. I also sent copies to someone in politics with whom the wife had carried a suck-up relationship for years. I'll eventually get around to sending something to DNB so they can make a correction. After about a week, I checked the docket sheet and just about fell out my chair laughing. There, on the bankruptcy court docket sheet was response to order filed by avenging witch. Not really, but you get the picture. Although I was highly amused, I was also a bit freaked out because I really didn't expect it to become part of the public record. However, I did expect there to be some sort of blowback. They are currently being sued for non-payment of rent by a past landlord. Their second time for this sort of thing. The first time they stopped paying rent, they were locked out of the premises, but according to court docs, picked the lock and moved their positions out in the middle of the night. Landlord sued and was granted a 45k judgment against them that they actually paid. They eventually quit paying rent to the new landlord and that is the case still in court. Since they broke their lease, they could be on a hook for around 400k. Concerned for their current landlord, I made sure to send them evidence of their tenant's propensity for stiffing their landlords and warned them not to let them get too fast past due. While looking over the filings of their current court case, I discovered a few inconsistencies. For example, the wife wrote in an email to the landlord that she was working to settle her debt with the IRS, and that had to be a priority. Hmm, the debt that was dismissed in bankruptcy? She also claimed that they had employees that had been there since the company started. Which is true. Mr. and Mrs. McGrifties, I am 99% sure they are the only ones. I shared that information with a plaintiff's attorney and suggested they were being rather disingenuous. Such a lovely word for liar. Oh, and that document too became part of the public record. I do take great satisfaction in knowing that they are now aware that someone is keeping track of their misfortunes and actively seeking to make them worse. Oh goodness, that reminds me. Shortly after I discovered all this information, I sent them a condolence card telling them that I had heard of their tax liens and judgments and it couldn't have happened to two more deserving people. Signed it, Karma Jerks. As for me, great things happened after I left them. I did get my unemployment, took a job that ended when my new boss resigned but it was just long enough to qualify. Pretty sure the McGrifties ended up being on the hook for most of it after all. I then went to work for a wonderful guy who paid for me to go back to college, finish my bachelor's and get a master's degree. As an undergrad, I co-wrote two papers with an awesome professor that were published in peer-reviewed journals. I've saved a nice sum of money, own a lake house and look forward to retiring in a few years and enjoy myself. All while the McGrifties basically have nothing. The offspring did marry MB recently, so I guess they'll have the hope that some of the money will migrate over to them. Or they can get MB to invest in their failure of a company. Let's hope there is a prenup. Thanks for hanging in there and hope you found it worth the read. Background I, 17 male, work at a grocery store. There are 20 aisles with aisle 1 being in line with the entrance, in the middle of the store, and aisle 20 being to the far left of the entrance. To the left of aisle 20 is a dairy section. The door leading to the cooler is towards the back of the store. Every hour I have to walk along the aisles with a clipboard and the lock sheet and check for debris in the aisles. 
Since I started working there, I've gone down to aisle 1, through aisle 1 to the front of the store, then back towards the dairy section. Earlier today, I started my route like normal, except this lady came out of an aisle and started to walk in front of me. I thought nothing of it and continued looking for debris in the aisles. I turned into aisle 1 and noticed the lady who was still in front of me. She got to the end of the aisle and I noticed she turned to go back towards the dairy section. I thought nothing of it and continued like normal. The actual event. I get to the dairy section and turn to go to the door when the lady in front of me turned around and asks me to get my manager. I call the manager and wait for him to come. The manager here today is my department manager and he and I have a good relationship. My manager gets there and the lady points at me and says, he was following me around and writing things down about me. That took me by surprise and I looked at my manager and he said, ma'am, he was checking for debris in the aisles. I even showed her the lock sheet which has the times along the top and the aisle numbers going down the side forming a table. She kept screeching about me following her that my manager said, fine ma'am, I'll reprimand him. He took me aside and asked me what happened and I told him, I was just doing my job and she asked me to get you. He said, I thought so, act like I'm yelling at you, okay? So he made motions with his arm and I hung my head. It was pretty funny. Then he said, just apologize and see if that gets her to move on. Not, I'll handle it. So we went over to the lady and I said, I'm sorry for the misunderstanding, ma'am. My manager told me to go to the back, so I did. I could hear her still screeching at him. 15 minutes later, my manager came into the back and said that she screamed at him for 10 minutes, so he got security to get her out. He also said if anything else like that happens to call him. I just got home and thinking back, it's pretty funny how he pretended to yell at me. <laughs> I'm the shop manager for a mom and pop trailer shop. I pretty much run everything as the owner, who is also my best friend for about 40 years, has two other businesses that he runs himself. Our work is high end as we do everything from simple repairs to complete custom built luxury travel trailers. Needless to say, entitled customers go with that territory. Having done this job for the last three decades, I'm used to them and can normally deal well with them. Last year, at the start of COVID, I was moving a trailer into the lot that had just been dropped off for repairs, so I had the gate open. As I was walking back to the gate to close and lock it, a pickup truck pulled into the lot. This gate is normally locked at all times even prior to COVID because we are an appointment only shop and we are located on a main highway between major cities and we get a lot of tourists, people that have no intention of buying anything but will waste all of our time. We are not a sales lot. The pickup was pulling a brand new fifth wheel toy hauler, a very high end one upwards of $200,000. This thing is huge and has all of the comfort of home and then some. Two flat screen TVs inside. And one more that slides out of a compartment outside. An outdoor kitchen and so on. I asked the driver to please back out of the gate so that I can close it and tell him that no one is allowed to drive in a lot except employees. He jumps out of the pickup and starts yelling that he has an appointment to put his trailer into storage here. I politely tell him that we do not do storage and that I have no more appointments for the day as we are closing for the weekend. He starts yelling at me that his best friend was the owner and was told that he could just drop the trailer anytime he damn well wanted to and proceeded to unhook the trailer. I told him that he must be in the wrong place because I stated we don't do storage. He just keeps unhooking the trailer and cussing at me because he's the owner's best friend and has been told he can do what he wants. I can tell him that we don't store trailers for anyone. He cusses at me some more and throws a business card and the keys to the trailer at me, jumps back in his pickup and literally peels out of the lot with his tires throwing rocks up breaking three windows on a nearby trailer. I move his trailer to the back of the lot and fill out a mechanics lane, including the damage to the windows and the cost of replacing them. I mail off all of the required paperwork the next day. I fully expect him to show up the following week to claim his trailer and plan on releasing it to him as soon as he pays for the windows. I sent repeated notices to the address on the card he gave me, but nothing. After 30 days, I can legally sell the trailer for whatever I can get out of it. I waited two months and he has still not returned. 
No calls or emails. Nothing. After the end of the third month, I finally decided to sell the trailer. I get the owner to sign all of the required paperwork. The owner must sign it because the business is a sole proprietorship. In file, everything was the proper authorities. On my way home, I decided to buy the trailer myself. Perfectly legal as I'm not the owner of the business. I call the owner and tell him that I'm buying the trailer and he tells me that the price is $50. The cost of the paperwork. I bought the trailer and me and the other two employees took a nice four-day weekend in it the following months. Last week, over a year after leaving the trailer, the entitled man showed up wanting his trailer. I informed him that it had been sold as abandoned because he never replied to any of the notices. He guessed it. He flipped his lid. He called the cops telling them that we had stolen his trailer and wanted us arrested. The cops showed up and I showed them all of the paperwork and proved that everything was done legally. I even offered to sell it back to him for the $50 that I had paid for it and an apology for the way he had talked to me when he dropped off the trailer. He of course wasn't having it. He started cussing the cops out and then took a swing at one of them. Needless to say, that did not end well for him. It turns out that he had a warrant and was trying to flee the state. I found out a few days later that he had embezzled a very large amount of money from the company that he had worked for. He is now sitting in jail awaiting trial and I'm taking my new trailer camping again this weekend. He would have probably gone away if he had just listened when I told him he was in the wrong place. Ha. Huh. Today was surprisingly eventful with this happening near an outdoor dining restaurant I was eating at. So the story was, I was sitting down just waiting for my order until I heard a commotion around the corner with a woman. She shoved two elderly, both a married couple around with plenty of people watching. And not stopping whatsoever, explaining she's doing it because she was being followed by the two. As soon as she stopped, the old man started to try swinging at her in self-defense to protect himself and his wife. He kept missing, but during that Karen kept yelling at him to stay away from her, even though she provoked him in the first place. There were plenty of witnesses, one who tried to keep the peace, another who was recording the whole thing. While Karen, unaware no one will believe her, yelled out for someone to call the police. People had already called the police and said that she needs to stay in order for her to face her actions, but she kept yelling, I don't want your illuminate police. I want the real police. Call the real police. It was three minutes of her yelling that and trying to claim she wasn't high whatsoever. One witness assumed because of her frizzy hair, action and red nose like Rudolph. She also tried to leave the crime scene by herself until the man who was trying to keep the peace stopped her and assumed she could get her side of the story to the police once they arrived and chose to stay close to her till the cop arrived. Later, three patrol officers arrived at the scene and started getting statements from any witness present. All the while I was texting my friends what was happening. Karen was asked to sit down with a peacemaker next to a cafe while the elderly couple was getting their statement translated by a Mandarin officer. They did not speak English but understood a few. The peacemaker tried to tell Karen to cooperate with the police to get it nice and smooth so she doesn't go through complications, but she refuses, stating that if she gave away her info, they'll make her disappear no matter what. After many attempts, the peacemaker gave up and told her she's on her own then, which led to her activating her victim card and saying she's a real victim here without informing on why. The officer tried to be calm and neutral for Karen to give her name, ID and story from her. But all Karen wanted was to make sure that the police wasn't fake by asking them to get her to the chief of police. The officer refused since it's not in his power to and he's just doing procedure. But she kept insisting that she needed to confirm one way or another, get the chief at any way possible. After about five minutes of back and forth, she tried standing up and leaving, trying to excuse it for using the bathroom. Although no restaurant allowed anyone to use the bathroom due to safety and COVID rules, and the officer had to stop her, but she refused to sit down and tried to walk away. So the officer grabs her and cuffs her and places her down back on the seat. She later goes into a full denial and says she didn't do anything wrong, that this was cruel, the police are as awful as televised, and so forth, spouting off nonsense while inversely upsetting the officer who was trying to be civil about it. 
She later, as her last resort, starts constantly kicking the officer's leg, thinking she has enough leg muscle, like Shinusuke Nakamura. The officer, having had enough, threw her on the ground, then with help was one of his partners, kept her on the ground, with one holding down her arm, placing his legs on top of hers. She started yelling, police brutality, you're hurting me, I'm the victim, call the real police, video her sacrifice. The officer asks for her to stop resisting and they will let go. But she still struggles and tries to play victim. Having had enough, the officers soon bring her back up, standing as they escort her to the police car, and that was the end of the incident. With a whooping 45 minutes of our time people witnessing an event like this. Ages ago, I was a senior developer for a company that revitalized other companies. Think of it as a sort of mini shark tank. We would find small businesses that had a great idea but were struggling. And we'd help them achieve their goals in exchange for a cut. Sometimes this meant providing development or engineering talent to get a product off the ground. Sometimes it meant providing literal capital. Sometimes it meant providing staffing services. Support staff and experienced executives or commonplace needs. We were also a relatively small company, so it wasn't uncommon for our people to have multiple hats. There was one time when I was working as development lead for one client while acting as interim CTO for another client. It could be a bit chaotic, but it paid pretty well. It was a great experience in a wide variety of things I normally wouldn't have had and was usually pretty fun. So one Friday afternoon we got a call from a client who was particularly frustrating. A frequent flyer, if you will. They seem to make every 30 second fix into an insurmountable problem. I'm going to be intentionally vague about the specific industry the client was in. It's a tiny industry, anyone in their industry will be able to identify them just from the industry and the city. This particular call comes in early in the afternoon, they recently moved things around, and now none of their printers work. Obviously, it's mission critical. We do some remote troubleshooting but can't even get a flicker of life from the device. We spend an hour or so trying to work through what happened before discovering that there is a really good reason it won't work. The cable didn't reach where they moved it to, so it wasn't actually plugged in. Well, that's about as stereotypical as an IT problem can get, right? Just plug it in and you'll be good to go. But management says that's not the solution they want. While it's totally possible to run a Cat5 line to the new location, they really want it wireless since that's the big thing these days. Okay, that's easy too. Most of our comparably sized clients had switched to wireless networking for part of their offices. So we already had the right procedures in place, deployment scripts set up and so on. All they had to do was plug in a device, which could be very easily acquired at any electronics store we could remotely handle everything else in a matter of minutes. But nope, management dictates that we absolutely have to have a person on site in the morning to set it up for them. At this point, it's very late afternoon on a Friday and everyone but me and my boss, the CEO, had gone home for the day. Boss isn't about to lose his weekend and crab rolls down hell. So I drew the short straw. We reached out to the client to make sure that they knew what they were asking. They were in Chicago. We were several states away in the Midwest, nearing the end of the day on a Friday. If they wanted me to be there by morning, they'd have to pony up for whatever flights we could arrange at short notice. And there was only one flight left that night going from our relatively small airport to Chicago, and the only available seat was in first class. Additionally, it would be taken off in just under two hours, meaning I wouldn't have time to get home and pack anything if I was going to make the flight. They reiterated that it was absolutely crucial that I be there in the morning, and they would happily pay for whatever flight was necessary. Additionally, I was told that they would have a room pre-booked at the Palmer house. They regularly used a room there for VIPs and such, and I could charge whatever I needed for the room. Further, they said that if I ended up needing to stay longer than a day, they would reimburse me for any clothing or essentials I had to purchase since it was so incredibly last minute. Okay, I can live with that. I get to the airport 10 minutes before boarding, make it through the vacant airport, past the TSA checkpoint, and to my gate as they are closing the gate. And to my gate as they are closing the door. Literally the last person on the last flight of the day. I arrive in Chicago and shockingly there is a company car. 
effectively a limo, let her leave black car service before Uber with a thing, waiting for me. He takes me to the hotel, as promised, and hands me an envelope before pulling away from the curb. The envelope contains a prepaid debit card and a note saying it has $250 on it for incidentals, but please charge anything I can to the room. Sweet. Was expecting it to be a long weekend in grungy clothes. Checked in and went to bed. The next morning, I showed up at their office brightly and early. The next morning, I showed up at their office bright and early. I sat around for half of the morning before anyone shows up to let me in. They then show me the new printer area, which is, as expected, well outside of the area of the office which was originally wired for networking, in what was once a break area. I go, yep, that's not gonna work with your old wired hub. Run across the street, literally door to door was one street apart, to the closest electronics store, pick up their shiny new wireless router, run back to their office, plug it in, then get on the closest computer, run through the 30 second setup, run the script that updates the configurations for their quirky, antiquated software, so it picks up the new printers in the office, and tell the owner that it's all set up. He gets this sort of confused look on his face and says, Already? I responded. I responded by pointing out that we did tell them in advance that we could do it remotely if they were willing to actually plug the device in for us. And he finally realizes how silly the callout was. But now he feels obligated to save face. I'm instructed that I am to remain in Chicago until the close of business Monday to ensure there are no issues with the new hardware until actual use. Obviously, it would be physically irresponsible to fly me out twice in a week. I ask for clarification. They are instructing me to stay checked into the fairly expensive hotel and keep billing things to my room through Monday night. Yes. What am I supposed to do with the rest of the weekend? Is there anything else at their local office that I can fix while I'm here? Well, no. Go eat a hot dog and play tourist. Just keep my phone handy and make sure I show up at opening time on Monday. Okay. I can do that. I go back across the street, pick up a charger for my phone, find a nearby department store and pick up a few changes of cheap clothes. Stop by the hotel to drop off my purchases and spend the rest of the weekend playing tourist. Okay, I did a tiny bit of sightseeing and spent most of the time catching up on sleep. But I did ensure to avail myself of room service for every single meal at their expense, before showing up bright and early Monday morning. I sat in their office for the majority of the workday before the owner came and found me to give me the travel details for my return flight. He even suggested that I'd done a great job. Really? I didn't do anything but plug a device in and should get a drink before heading to the airport and bill it to the room. As suggested, I went back to the hotel, packed my stuff in my laptop bag, stopped in the bar for a drink, who knew hotels had $100 plus drinks, and headed to the airport. All told, they showed out about $1,000 just for the room, probably two-thirds of that in room service fees, several hundreds in transportation to and from the airport, not to mention the flights, and all because they didn't want to walk across the street, pick up the easily obtainable piece of hardware, and plug it in. I got a three and a half day vacation with first class travel, one way anyway, half across the country, for doing just that.